I said, well, that's kind of what I, I'm actually from a family where no news is good news, so I guess that's the case. Yeah, you had a whole real problem because you're saying that very well. <laughs> all right, well, this, did everybody get this handout? Did everybody get a copy of this? So I worked on this all afternoon. I put it up here also, and so I just want us to walk through, as today we're going to be starting in Lesson 50, we're going to be in, in uh, Chapter 10 down here, but I want us to just kind of review where we're at. And I know we hadn't talked about uh, uh, the rapture necessarily in the context of the timeline, so I wanted to point that out to you. I didn't put it on the chart, but you can write it in if you want to, because there's you know a few different views of that, so we kind of go over that and we'll mention it in passing, and we're not going to talk about the, the timing of the rapture and all that stuff in detail. But let's go back now. This is chapter 1 up here. So chapter 1 just kind of sets the scene. You have the Apostle John says he's on the Isle of Patmos. And he sees, and you remember he has that description of Jesus Christ. You remember he was good friends with Jesus Christ. Very good. Traveled all over. And yet when he saw the resurrected Christ, you remember what his response was when he saw this resurrected Lord of Lords, King of Kings coming? Remember what he did? He fell down like a dead man because when he saw this resurrected one that appeared as a son of man, so, and he gives that detail with the white hair and the burnished bronze, and he was trying to describe what he's seeing, and his face, sun, it was like looking into the sun itself. So we see this amazing picture when this son of man comes, and we see John's response, and then we see the son of man that commands him to write this to the seven churches of Asia. And so chapters 2 and chapters 3 are simply him writing these letters to the seven churches, and as we talked about a couple weeks ago, um, there are three different ways we can apply those. You remember? So we can apply it as historical churches, and then also we apply them to churches in general. So it's a good way for us to look at our church and other churches to see our, which one are we most like. And then there's a personal application. We can even look at them and say, okay, let's look at my own life and see if I can compare myself to one of the churches. Because some of them, like Philadelphia, he didn't give any commendation. Gave so we want to try to move towards those and move away some of the ones that he condemned particularly we talked about the one at Laodicea the last one which had become lukewarm they've been uh, comfortable they've been believers for a long time and just gotten stuck in tradition and now they were kind of neither hot nor cold they were just you could say like nominal Christians we're Christians and we're all right but they had lost their uh, their love their first passion and then we come to chapter four and then we have the vision of God's throne and so we talked about this at the time but this is if we talk about what is probably the most common among evangelical uh, uh, churches and teachers on the rapture, this is how they interpret it, because it doesn't say the rapture, but this is the timing. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 are considered kind of historical, and then there's a break between 3 and 4. So they say that essentially John here in chapter 4 is a picture of the rapture, because in a sense he is raptured. He's, he's taken up or he's raptured. So the timeline, what's called the pre-tribulation <laughs> rapture, begins here at chapter 4. And the reason, the logic behind that, I'm not going to go into all the scripture references. We might do that another time. But the reason is because in chapter 3, the church, chapters 1, 2, and 3, the church is mentioned, I think, 19 times. But after chapter 3, the church is never mentioned until 19, which we'll get to next week. So the fact that all of these things are talked about, you'll notice the church is never mentioned. Mentioned. So the view is, the, as people uh, interpret that, is that the church is not there because they're never mentioned through this whole tribulation. So the picture is that Jesus is going to come back. He's going to rapture the church, the Gentiles, before the Gentiles who come to faith. This Gentile age will end. Christ will take up the uh, Gentile believers, and then the tribulation will begin as a part of the judgment. And then you remember, we come down to uh, these seals on this scroll, which are open, which begin in uh, chapter 6. Remember chapter 5? Uh, the Apostle John's looking. There's a scroll that's brought forth, and he starts to cry because there's no one in heaven, on earth, or even beneath the earth that is worthy to open the scroll. And then it says, one, the Lion of Judah comes. It appears as the Lamb who was slain, and that is the only one who is uh, qualified or is able to open the seals of the scroll. Here starts our S's, so I'm going to try not to get tongue-tied. So we have the scrolls, the seals, and then all the numbers. So then in chapter 6, we start the opening of the seals of the scroll, and the first, second, third, and fourth are often called the four horsemen. The four horsemen they call the ap apocalypse. So that's the first four seals as they're opened, and you can go back and review all those. Then the fifth one we have, the fifth seal is the appeal of the martyrs, those who have died, and it's kind of mysterious. There's lots of interpretations. Honestly, there's some things that you're just going to have to say, 
These are mysteries. And remember, I think even John himself didn't understand. He's just reporting what he sees to the best of his ability. And then we have the sixth seal is a list of all these natural disasters as many people lose their lives. And then between the sixth seal and the opening of the seventh seal, we have this interlude in chapter 7, which is when we see this picture of this, all this uh, redemption of Israel. And so we look back at that passage in Romans. It says, and there will be, they will be regrafted, or there will be this, uh, this temporary hardening of Jews, but that they will all uh, come back in the end. And so again, there's a little bit of mystery, because I'm sure it's not exactly 144,000. There are some symbolic in a lot of the numbers, as we talked about. But we see these 144,000 who come to faith. They follow Jesus as the Messiah in the midst of the tribulation, and they sort of become this missionary force. And a reason, again, we go back to the pre-tribulation rapture that all the Gentile believers, which would be you and me if the Lord returns, will be moved out is because there is no church. So that is what these 144,000 are the ones who begin spreading the gospel because the church has been uh, raptured. Then we come into, so that's an interlude. Then we come to chapter 8, and that's where we see the seventh seal is open. And as a part of the seventh seal, and if you picture it, remember it's like a scroll, so they've been taken off the seal, so when the seventh seal is taken off, now you can actually open the scroll. So that's how, it doesn't actually say that, but that's how I imagine it, because it helps me remember when the seventh seal is broken, now inside of the seventh seal, there are going to be seven trumpets and seven vials. So that's kind of how I remember when you get to the seventh seal, now you open the last one, now you can actually unveil the scroll, and then you see a lot of other things happening. And uh, as we see there in chapter 8, seventh seal, we looked at the first four, which are all natural disasters, which have a lot of death and suffering. And last week we ended in chapter 9, right? Yes. With the opening of the abyss or the bottomless pit. And we see all these very strange demonic sort of creatures that are coming out and tormenting people. Um, and then we see the sixth trumpet, which is where we ended last week, that reveals this army, two million man army. And it says that a third of mankind is killed by fire, smoke, and sulfur. And we, look, we talked about how that's probably perhaps modern warfare is what he's, he's describing as he talks about the things that are going on there. And that brings us to chapter 10. So I'm going to pop the, I'll, I'm going to come back to that probably at the end of the lesson and I'll put it up next week too. Is that helpful for you to have all that on one chart? It was helpful for me. And of course, this is a very short, short summary of what's going on. But on Sunday, I tried to just do it from my memory and my mind and it was almost comically bad. So I decided to put it on paper this week. All right, page 211, chapter 10. Um, as you can see, it starts in chapter 10. You can see the summary here. We see an angel comes to John and gives him a small scroll with a prophecy for John to proclaim to the people. And so in chapter 10, you can see at the top of page 211, it says this chapter describes a break or an interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpets. So you'll remember we have between here, between the sixth, seal that was open and the seventh seal there was an interlude now between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet there is now another interlude where this uh this uh, angel comes down with a small scroll and gives it to john and john eats it and tells him to proclaim so 10 is kind of this interlude and then we're going to see the beginning in chapter 11 of this uh what's about to unfold as we this interlude ends so you look middle of page 211 it says, in this chapter, we can see without question, God is dealing with the Jews because the Jewish temple is going to be described. The Jewish temple has been rebuilt and the Jewish nation is worshiping there again. Now, this is news to John the Apostle because he wrote this in about 90 A.D. or so. And the temple, we know, was destroyed in 70 A.D. So when John is having this vision, there is no temple. It has been destroyed about 20 years previously. So I'm sure John is very uh, surprised to see here's the temple, and now it has re been rebuilt. And uh, so that's why since 70 A.D., the Jewish people have not done animal sacrifices, the sacrifice of atonement, because there's only one place you can do the sacrifice on the Day of the Atonement, and that's in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And it was destroyed, and now, of course, I forget the exact year, but they built the, uh, an Islamic uh, shrine to the Prophet Muhammad that's called the Dome of the Rock. And there's a little mosque in it, but there's a footprint on the rock, and that's where the Muslim people, when they controlled that area, said that's where Muhammad stepped on that rock as he leapt up in one of their traditions as he kind of visited heaven in one of their uh, traditions that they had. Even though in the Quran and everything, he never left Saudi Arabia, so it's kind of a strange tradition. But anyways, that, that is built on the spot where the temple was. So the picture we have here, and it doesn't tell us any details whatsoever, but this picture is 
this temple at some point in the future is going to be rebuilt on that spot. And so he sees a vision of that. And then, as it talk, details a little bit in chapter 11, um, there's going to be this Antichrist. We talked a little bit about last week. This Antichrist, we don't know the details, but he's going to come in and he's going to come into this temple and he's going to do something. Here's what the Antichrist is going to do after this temple has been rebuilt. They're doing the sacrificial uh, uh, services have begun again. But the Antichrist was going to come in and he's going to stop the sacrifices, the offerings that are in the temple, and he is going to desecrate it. And then it goes on to read, as you can see that next uh, verse in uh, verse 2, I should say, of chapter 11. And it said that this desecration, which is this trampling on it by the Antichrist, is going to last about three and a half years. And then after that happens, there's going to be these very strange characters that no one is sure who they are. And they're called the two witnesses. And you'll see there in the middle of 2.11, uh, it mentions this in uh, chapter 11, 3, and we're going to move fast tonight. I apologize for that. But we just have to make it all the way through. So in verse 3, there are these two witnesses. And uh, it, says, it says there, the two miracles they perform in 11, 5, and 6 remind us of what two Old Testament characters. So here are the, the miracles. One, they're able to cause a drought. So it says they're able to speak and shut up the skies. Now what um, Old Testament prophet does that remind you of? I'm not going to put it on the screen to you. Elijah, you. Elijah that's right. Remember, he, he prayed and it didn't rain for several years. Then he prayed and it did rain. And then the other one was that they could turn water into blood and cause all kinds of plagues to happen. Now, which prophet does that remind you of? Moses. Of Moses, right, in Egypt. So, that's the, so a lot of people say that this is either some form of Elijah and Moses or it's, we're not sure they're myster mysterious. But then they're able to preach for about three and a half years. And at the end of the three and a half years, the Antichrist, a big army comes and it kills them. And they leave the bodies. You'll read this in chapter 11. They leave the bodies laid out. And by the way, it says everyone in the world watches these witnesses and watch them be destroyed. Now, in John's time, that would seem impossible. Does that seem very impossible in our day? That the whole world could be watch this thing as it unfolds? And now it seems very easy, right? They're just, uh, it's going to probably be on the satellite TV or maybe even on our phones, all the things that will happen in the future. Not impossible at all. And then they're killed. Let me go ahead and put that up there. They will be killed and their bodies will be laid in the streets of Jerusalem for the whole world to see for three and a half days. And then it says the Spirit of God will come into them and in front of the whole world they will be resurrected, these two these two messengers or these two prophets. And so that ends this sort of interlude, and then I'll let y'all finish writing that down, then we'll move on to 2.12, and we'll look at the seventh and final trumpet, which is to be blown before the vials begin. So over on page 2.12, the seventh trumpet, I'm just going to read that line underneath Trumpet 7, it says in chapter 11, verse 15, the seventh angel sounds, and we see a, b a brief preview of what is to happen during the remainder of the tribulation. And uh, the bottom line is this is the end. We are about to send, see, and it sort of gives a summary. So this isn't just a war that's going on then. That's describing the end of the cosmic war that's been going on since Satan rebelled in heaven. So this isn't just an earthly perspective. This, this thing that we're talking about now, it's even really hard for us to understand. Obviously, it's going to be hard for the Apostle John to describe. It's the end of this cosmic war that's been going on since before Adam and Eve were even created at the fall of the angels. So that's really what we're describing. And then we see John look up into the heavens, and he sees something, again, that must have surprised him. He sees the Ark of the Covenant, which is mentioned in verse 19. And as it says there, the Ark is a symbol of God's presence with Israel. It indicates the time of Jacob's trouble is almost over, which is what the uh, Old Testament prophets had predicted. Now, he doesn't go into a lot of explanation. Again, John, remember, he's really just reporting on what he sees. He doesn't do a lot of commentary, so we don't have a lot of exact explanation. 
And then in chapter 12, in the first few lines, we're going to see something that we have to pay attention to. So we're about to talk about the dragon and the pregnant woman. But he begins it by saying, Then he, the angel came to him and pointed out and said, This is a sign. So anytime we see that framework that it says this is a sign, now what does it mean, let's say, that we're driving down into, uh, I don't know, driving into Mex New Mexico, for example, and you come up, and you all have probably all done this. I don't know if you do it in New Mexico, but when you're going somewhere and you all get out, you take a picture by the sign. Now, yeah. the sign, just think for me a little bit, kind of philosophically, the sign itself is not New Mexico, right? New Mexico is this huge space, but the sign is just an image or a representation of the state of what's going on. That's what a sign is. A sign is not the thing itself. It's just something that indicates something that's happening. And so we're going to see two things that are called signs. We're going to see in the chapter 12, um, he talks about this dragon, and he also talks about this woman. But both of them, it specifically says that this, this was a sign. So what does this mean? It simply means he didn't look up in the sky or in the future. We're not going to look, look up in the sky and see a huge, giant, pregnant woman up in the sky and see a huge, giant dragon and these sort of things going on. What does it mean? It's a little bit mysterious. We're not sure, but the angel says this is a sign of what is to come. So it's just sort of a visual representation of what is going to happen in the spiritual realm. As you can see there, the middle paragraph said there's two main characters, two main signs in the chapter, the woman and the dragon. The woman represents God's chosen people from whom the Messiah was to come and through whom the church, uh, was, the, the church was born. Who is the dragon and what does he try to do? Let's see if you can have a guess. If you were to guess, who is the dragon? It says explicitly who the dragon is in verse 9. He is Satan. And Satan tries to devour the child and the church. He's not able to do so. So then he turns his ire on to the other children of the woman or the other people other than the child and the church. And there's a lot more details in here. I have a lot of notes, but for time's sake, I'm going to move on because we still have a lot to cover. And by the way, in that picture, of course, that's where it says and that he was uh, thrown out of heaven after a battle with a third of the other angels, and that's where that idea that a third of the angels fell with Satan, that's where we get that, that picture from. But let's move on to chapter 13. So in the chapter 13, we're going to see two more beasts, and these are, again, very mysterious things. The first, he says he sees a beast that comes up from the ocean or from the sea. And it says here, it's a composite of the four beasts that represent the successive world empires mentioned in Daniel 7. However, it's clear that this world power goes far beyond any historical world power that has yet existed because this beast is going to influence the whole world. And then, uh, then there's a second beast that comes up after that beast. And the second beast essentially, I'm going to make sure I don't jump ahead on our answer here, but the second beast mainly what he does is to point back towards the first beast to lift him up. So it's sort of the picture here is he's just lifting him up. And this uh, second beast does what we're about to put up here now, which it mentions in verses 13 through 15. The second beast is able to perform miracles. And these are the Antichrist and then the other beast which lifts up this Antichrist so they perform miracles. Even the text, it seems like he actually resurrects the first beast from the dead and then tries to get people to worship the image of the first beast. And that's one thing we always have to be very careful of, even in our age, just a little bit of application. Throughout church history, the thing that has been um, used most often to deceive people is miracles. And that's a little bit surprising. But the thing that's often been misused are signs and miracles and sort of wonderful sort of things used to promote false teaching. We've seen that all throughout church history. So we don't always, if you see somebody, well, they can do a miracle, you don't assume, oh, well, they must be right. And the same thing is with the other signs. Uh, for example, um, Joseph Smith, do you know what his sign was before he started the Mormon faith? He spoke in tongues. And so he's speaking in tongues, these signs, we always have to be very careful about this miraculous, these things, when they can do these things, because what I remember, even Jesus says, people are going to come to him at the judgment, and they're going to say what? 
We did wonderful things. We did all these ma uh, miracles, and we proclaim all in your name. And what is he going to say to those people? Depart from me. I never knew you. So here we see a picture of the beast. The Antichrist is going to be able to do miracles. And so, but what is our measure of truth? It's always got, if you were here on Sunday, it's the B in Baptist, right? It's the Bible is our authority. That's always our measurement of a teacher, not the signs or amazing things they can do or how well they can speak or how big a show they can put on. It's always what they're teaching as we hold up God's standard in his word to that. Okay, then we go over to the top of page 213. The second beast will force people to receive a mark, this famous mark. Again, this is mysterious on how this is going to work. And the word mark means to impress or to stamp or to put an emblem or emboss. And without this mark, they will be unable to buy or sell. What is the mark according to 1318? Of course, this is the famous number of a man, which is, and it says, uh, it says there in the Greek, 666. Now, what does that mean? I looked it up, and there's lots of different ideas, and I'm not even going to cover a lot of this. The bottom line is, and that's what it says here, no one really knows what it means. There's lots of theories. Some people have to do with six governments and six things. Some people say, well, because man was made on the sixth day, it's man supplanting the Trinity, so you have 666. A lot of ideas, and they're all, I guess, pretty good ideas. But again, this is where we just have to say John is really just describing what he's seeing, and he's not explaining and providing commentary, so we just have to be content to just say, it's going to happen. How's it going to happen? I'm not sure. But as we even looked at Old Testament prophecies that seem strange in the day they were given, on this side, once you're on the other side, you'll see it, and we should be able to recognize it if we were there to be able to see it. But of course, if you're pre-tribulation and we're gone, then guess what? We'll be watching from heaven, I guess, which we'll see in a moment. We'll be the, uh, the uh, believers in heaven will be cheering by the end of this. Okay, so no one knows, it says there for sure, what the exact meaning is of that number but it will play a principal part in identifying the Antichrist. But I think we can already see some sort of technologies, right? How would you possibly be able to keep people from buying and selling? Again, in John's day, they would say, well, that's not possible. Because in that day, you just used gold and silver. You know, you could trade for things. But how do most people now do business? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was watching this documentary on 2008. Did you know, apparently, according to some of the things, we were very, very close... Whenever the banks were not able to loan money to each other, they were going to close down all ATMs, and you would only be able to take out a certain amount of money from there. And it didn't matter how much money you had in the bank because of the, the banks weren't loaning and the crash was crashing. It was going to break the system. And that's essentially that's what they did in Argentina and they did in other countries. So they limit it. They say, we got to get this figured out. So in the meantime, we're just going to limit what people are able to do. So with the technology, we can already see kind of a hint of how this might be possible in the future to set up some sort of system where people will be ostracized. They can't do business unless they, whatever this mark is, but unless they have this mark. They're already marketing chips to, to put in so you can't have your identity. Stolen. Yeah. And that seems so strange to me because... Yeah. And so it's, I mean, I think, anyways... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure the criminal elements, the hackers, and everything else probably have some sort of working. But uh, but anyways, the point's well taken. You know, in John's time, a lot of these things to John seemed like that just seems crazy and impossible. But now to us, it seems not so impossible. We might not have it figured out, but we certainly can understand a little bit better than that. Okay, chapter 14. And again, chapter 14 is really going to, again, just give a little simple sort of preview, like a table of contents of what's about, what is about to happen through the rest of the book. As it says, I'm just going to read that paragraph. This chapter is literally a miniature glimpse of the rest of the book. It's like a table of contents for the remainder of Revelation. It describes very briefly the establishment of the kingdom, which we're going to be looking at, the vials of wrath, the seven uh, bowl, vials, by the way, in your ESV modern translations, it, they're called bowls of wrath and the Battle of Armageddon, which we're going to be looking at next week. I think that's next week. No, that's, well, I forget. I did all the lessons, so I've got them all confused in my mind. And uh, so we'll be looking at the Battle of Armageddon. And then that brings us to chapter 15, where now it starts to go through that more slowly after the summary in chapter 14. So as you see there, the chapter, this chapter is a prelude to the seven last plagues, which are not described until chapter 16. 
The people mentioned in this chapter are apparently those who suffered the persecution and death from the beast in chapter 13. And they sing the song of Moses, which is written out there, makes up most of this chapter is this song. Now, who exactly are these people? Again, there's lots of good ideas, but no one's really sure who these people are. Are they people from heaven? Are they people here? And there's different ideas. But when you just read it and try to take it literally, and I looked at different interpretations, it's, again, just very difficult to know. And then it brings us to chapter 16, where we see these uh, vials or these bowls of wrath which are being poured out um, after the trumpets are finished. And these are the final seven things that will be done to bring to conclusion this cosmic battle that's been going on for ages and ages. So, brief, we're going to look at these, uh, these vials. The first one is sores. The second one you're going to see also, I want you to try to think of what sounds familiar about this, sores or boils, might be what thing you could call them. Then the second vial is turning the sea to blood. And when that happens, everything in the sea will die. So you can imagine the smell of what's going on, whatever's happening in the ocean, the sea. And then the third vial, the springs or the rivers, the fresh water turns to blood or is contaminated somehow. And you can see, what are you kind of thinking of as you hear these? Thinking of the plagues in Egypt. Then the fourth vial on page 214, it says the sun. In this judgment, the sun intensifies so much that people are scorched by the heat. Some people, as it says there, think, see this as a reference to nuclear uh, weapons that will destroy the ozone. Uh, some people think there's maybe like a solar flare. I don't know if you've seen I watched a documentary on that. That was pretty terrifying that a solar flare could actually jump up and burn us up any day, and we never, wouldn't even see it coming. So... Again, these are things that with modern knowledge that don't seem, um, certainly don't seem impossible at all. There are a number of ways that that can be accomplished. But what do people do as a result of these horrible, horrible uh, judgments from God? Do they turn to God? No, it says that they blaspheme the name of the Lord and they do not repent or give him his glory. And we see this, you probably notice we've had that happen again. This is mentioned periodically. Um, and it says, you know, even when we get to talking about hell and things that are going on there, there's a lot of mystery there. But I think as you read this, you certainly get the picture, which a, a lot of uh, Bible teachers and commentators will say, that nobody in hell is going to be saying, hey, I wish I was getting out. That's the picture we're drawing here, is that people's hearts have become so hard and they hate God so much um, to quote, um, I'm forgetting the philosopher's name, it's eluding me, but he said, I would rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. And that's, uh, was it? I'm not going to say, John Paul Sartre, was one, I think I may have mentioned that two weeks ago, but that's sort of the, this attitude. And what's, that, what's the picture coming out there? It's just pride, which is why, of course, the Bible says the worst sin, all sins flow out of this pride, is I, at all costs, I would rather go through misery. I will not let go of my pride. I will not submit myself to the God who has made me, to what his will is. That brings us to the fifth vial, which again is going to remind us of the plagues in Egypt, which is darkness. And this vial, as it says, if you want to go read the details, it's directed or it's focused on the throne of the Antichrist. And this darkness will have grave psychological effects on people. And what will they do? It uses a really strange language that they will gnaw or they will chew on their tongues because of the pain. And it says again, however, they will not ask for a uh, turn to God and repent or ask for mercy from God. Instead, they will curse God and blaspheme his name as they're going through these judgments. We're going to be looking at a map here in just a second, so I'll let you write that down, and then we'll move on through the sixth vial pretty quickly. So the sixth vial specifically says the Euphrates River dries up, and uh, as it says there, the Euphrates River will no doubt be the eastern boundary of Israel at this time. Now the question is, well, why would he say that? Well, if you go back and you look at the prophecy when God uh, gave a uh, promise to Abraham, he told them that his people, his descendants, would rule from the Egyptian river to the Euphrates, Euphrates River. Oop, that's actually an answer on here. Um, so that was the promise of God. And if you look through all history, 
during the time of Solomon, Solomon sort of administered some of those areas, but there's never been a time when the nation of Israel actually spanned that entire from river to river. So now what we're going to do on page 215, I'm going to put a map up here, and here's the question at the top of page 215. If Israel were to possess the inheritance promised in Genesis 15, what countries or portions of modern-day countries would they have to conquer or would have to? All right, so I'm going to put a map up here before I put the answers over. So let's see what we got. So here we got, so here's, here's Israel. And by the way, Israel's not as big. This is kind of blown up. So now, first of all, the, the river of Egypt. What would you think the river of Egypt is? So the Nile River it's, is here. And what would be the Euphrates River? Is this river here that goes right through the middle of Iraq. So if it was to span from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates River. So now let's look. There are six countries that in whole or in part are going to be a part of Israel in this future time during the tribulation. So let's see if we can figure these all out. We'll start easy. Let's go left to right. Obviously, part of modern-day Egypt is going to have to be there. And then what are some other ones? You come over to the south. Certainly part of Saudi Arabia. We have here, of course, Jordan, which is here. Lebanon is here. Then you have Syria. And then, of course, part of the southwestern part of Iraq. And, of course, if we were to have looked at the map last year, there was a whole other country that now it's gone. You remember the country that was there last year that followed the Euphrates River up in Syria? It was the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or we know it as what? ISIS, which controlled. It was, they said we were a sovereign state was here, but that state was very short-lived, so we don't have to look at them. And then Kuwait could be here, which is as well. And that would be the seventh. Yeah, all those are there, and I'll go back to the map in just a second. Of course, it's on your next page if you want to turn to 216. You have that exact map in your book right there, and that's the next question <clears throat> that's there. So what modern-day superpower would edge them closer to, which Turkey would sort of separate the two, but it would be Russia would be that country, that northern power, which would come down Russia, potentially. Russia, yeah. And then we see at the bottom of page uh, 215, the seventh vial, the seventh bowl. And it says there will be an earthquake which has not been experienced since mankind came on the earth will come. And uh, it appears, as it says here, that this earthquake is going to cause everything to sort of um, look differently. And to add to this catastrophe, there's this huge uh, whale, st uh, whale stones, hailstones that weigh a talent, which is about 75 or some people say 100 pounds which will fall from the heavens and in spite it ends again with that same thing that's being repeated in spite of all these things that are happening the people who are left the people who survive do not turn to God but instead they blaspheme and they curse curse God because of the judgments and of course now we see that your mind back to the picture we have in Egypt right what was the response of the Pharaoh and indeed the Egyptian people so their, their hearts were hardened. And remember what? They finally let the, Isra the uh, Israelites leave. And then what did they do? As soon as they kind of came to up, they went and tried to chase them down, right? And try to recapture them. And that is the end of Lesson 50. And we'll be picking up with Chapter 17 next week. Questions? <coughs>